Have you ever stared at an economics exam question and just frozen up? We've all been there. Well, today we're going to tackle one of those classic questions, the velocity of money. And by the end of this, you won't just get it, you'll have a complete blueprint for writing a perfect answer. Let's dive in. So this is it. This is the challenge. Fisher versus Cambridge. You know, this question trips up a ton of students because it's not just about memorizing formulas. It's about getting your head around two totally different ways of thinking about how our economy works. So let's break down exactly what you need to do to nail this. First things first, before we even get into the weeds with Fisher and Cambridge, let's just get a really simple, intuitive feel for what velocity of money even is. Let's forget the textbook jargon for a second and start with a basic story. At its heart, it's actually super simple. Just think of it as a way to measure how hard each dollar in the economy is working, right? Is that dollar just sitting under someone's mattress? Or is it out there, moving from person to person, buying things, and creating economic activity? That speed, that's its velocity. This slide makes it crystal clear. Imagine a tiny little economy with only one $10 bill in it, okay? So you take that $10 and you buy a book. Then the bookseller takes that exact same $10 bill and uses it to buy coffee. Now stop and think about that. That one single $10 bill just supported $20 of economic activity. Its velocity was two because it changed hands twice. That's it. That's the whole concept. All right, so now that we've got the basic idea down, let's get to the real core of our exam question. Two big schools of thought came along to explain what actually drives this velocity, and their perspectives could not be more different. By the way, for a fantastic refresher on all of this, you should definitely check out the chapter on money and inflation in Mankey's Principles of Economics. And this table right here illustrates the fundamental clash perfectly. On one side, you have Irving Fisher. He saw velocity as a kind of mechanical feature of the economy. Think of it like the plumbing system. Its speed is determined by stuff like banking technology and how often people get paid. But on the other side, you've got the Cambridge School. And for them, it's all about human behavior. They asked a totally different question. Why do people choose to hold on to cash? So really, it's a battle between institutions versus psychology. You know, the equations themselves tell the entire story. Fisher's famous MV equals PT puts velocity, V, right there in the spotlight. But then you look at the Cambridge equation, MY equals KPY. They're obsessed with K. That's the proportion of income people choose to hold as cash. For them, velocity isn't something you measure directly. It's just the inverse of that choice. See, if people get nervous and decide to hold more cash, K goes up. And if they're holding more, then logically money has to be moving slower. So V goes down. That simple relationship, V equals one over K, that is the mathematical key that links these two worldviews. Okay, so the theory is making sense, but how do you actually translate all of this into top marks on your exam paper? Let's build the perfect answer step-by-step. Step. I'm gonna give you a five-step blueprint that is guaranteed to impress any grader. Here is your game plan. You start with Fisher. Define his version of V. It's stable, it's driven by institutions. Then you pivot to Cambridge. You introduce their behavioral idea of K. Now this next part, step four, is absolutely critical. You have to directly contrast the two and you must use that V equals one over K formula to show you understand the connection. Finally, you bring it home with a big implication in step five. Because Cambridge's V is based on human choice, it's way less stable. You follow this structure, you've built an airtight answer. So what does this blueprint actually look like in practice? Let's take a look at a model answer that puts all of these pieces together just beautifully and efficiently. Okay, so this is what excellence looks like. Notice those keywords. Fisher's velocity is determined by payment habits. That's the institutional mechanical part. But Cambridge's velocity is determined by economic agents' choices. That's the human behavioral part. See how this answer doesn't just list the two definitions, it zeroes in on that single most important point of contrast? That is the kind of sharp analysis that gets you the highest marks. To really knock this out of the park, you have to get inside the head of the person grading your paper. What are they really looking for? What separates a pretty good answer from a truly excellent one? Let's pull back the curtain on how this stuff gets scored. So, here's what your grader is thinking. An average answer? You probably explained Fisher's side pretty well. A good answer. You explained both, but the connection between them was maybe a little fuzzy. But the excellent answer? Ah, that's the one that absolutely nails the distinction. It clearly explains what K is, and this is the key. It explicitly states that V equals one over K. 
That little formula is the secret signal to the greater that you don't just know the facts, you truly understand the relationship. And that's the bottom line. Our model answer isn't just good enough. It is specifically engineered to land in that top excellent category. By hammering home that core distinction, institutional mechanics versus behavioral choice, it ticks every single box on the graders checklist. Look, acing the exam is the immediate goal, and that's great, but real learning is about understanding how these ideas connect to the bigger picture in economics. So let's take a quick peek at where this road leads next, the Cambridge schools focus on why people hold money. Well, that directly leads to the great John Maynard Keynes and his three famous motives for holding cash. Later on, Milton Friedman comes along and modernizes the whole theory. And maybe the most interesting part is you can actually go look at the real world data and see for yourself. Is velocity stable or isn't it? This is where theory really smacks into reality. And that brings us to the big final question that matters so much even today. If Fisher was right and velocity is stable and predictable, then controlling inflation is pretty straightforward. You just control the money supply. But if the Cambridge School was right and people's fear or their confidence can suddenly change how fast money moves, well, then the job of a central banker becomes infinitely more complicated. That's the debate that started over 100 years ago, and it's a puzzle that central banks are still wrestling with every single day.